So, uh, welcome to all of our, uh, uh, our viewers here uh, at Presenza. Uh, today we are going to be conducting an interview with uh, Piers Robinson um, on the subject which uh, has kind of flown under the radar a little bit um, this week. The, um, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons published a report which basically laid blame at the the hands of the uh, Syrian government for a an alleged chemical uh, weapons attack in 2018 in, uh, in the town of, of Saraki. Um, it has gone kind of accepted by all of the, the, the mainstream media, but when you start looking around, you see that there are there are concerns about this. So we are talking today with, uh, with Piers Robinson from the uh, Organization for Pro Propaganda Studies in the UK. Uh, he's going to tell us about his organization and hopefully give us a few more elements of information which we can use in order to consider whether the, uh, the report coming out of the uh, OPCW is, uh, is useful or not. So, um, so Piers, thank you so much for accepting this request for uh, for an interview. We're very happy to to have you with us. And um, before we go into the details of the the, the chemical weapon attack in, in Syria, could you tell us a little bit uh, about yourself, your background, and also the organisation for propaganda studies? Sure. I, uh, my background as an academic for twenty years or twenty years plus, if you include my PhD, um, worked at. Bristol University, whilst doing my PhD, and then at local university, Manchester, and then at Sheffield University. Uh, for the last two years, I've been an independent researcher. Um, I've organized where well, I'm involved with the Organization for Propaganda Studies, which is really very much a fledgling uh, organization. I've actually been very busy working on matters relating to the OPCW, which has taken up most of my time in the last two years. But the Organization for Propaganda Studies is essentially being established by, by a group of academics and researchers. And it really grew out of my own academic inquiry, which took me from the realm of foreign policy and political communication and study of the media for many years into a more focused examination of what we would historically have called propaganda. But today we, we have a range of euphemisms uh, public relations, political marketing, strategic communication, and so on. Um, and my interest in, in this is very much driven by, in a sense, a normative or ethical concern about the way in which propaganda disrupts democratic processes. That in democracies where propaganda has a strong hold, it becomes very difficult for public to hold their government to account for rational and informed debate. Um, and really the Organization of Propaganda Studies was set up because as myself and some colleagues felt that a lot of scholars um, had the blind spot when it came to propaganda and democracies. That of course the term public relations was coined by Eddie Bernays in order to uh, rename propaganda because propaganda got a bad name by the 1950s. Um, and so these techniques of manipulation, which include deception, the variety of other manipulation techniques are still very much current in contemporary democracies, but we call them something else. And because we call them something else, people are less aware, and even academics are less aware of how significant these processes are. So, so really the OPS has been set up to try and foster over time sort of growing engagement from academics, but also the public into these questions of propaganda and this kind of idea that propaganda isn't just uh, out there in authoritarian states or historically during wartime. It's actually very much alive and surrounding us um, in our own democracies. And and that's really the, the kind of raising debt for, for the OPS. But as I say, it's, it's a fledgling organization and I've, I haven't had as much time to devote to it as I would have liked to because of uh, really my involvement on the, the OPCW and Syria issue for the last couple of years, which has taken up the lion's share of my time. Sure. Now let's get into that because this week, as I said, the introduction, um, the OPCW released uh, another report. Um, the Syrian government has very angrily denounced this report. Um, and so we're kind of left with uh, a, a sensation that, you know, someone's telling the truth, someone's not telling the truth. But um, 
before we go into that, what what is it that we actually know about this particular attack that happened in Sarakib in, in 2018? Yes, the report issued by UOPCW is its um, attribution mechanism, the IIT, which um, has been tasked with attributing blame for uh, alleged chemical attacks which have already been investigated by the OPCW's own fact-finding mission. So the IIT report this week is essentially taking as a basis uh, the original FFM report into this alleged attack and then attributing blame. And in this case, as you correctly point out, or correctly say, they have attributed blame to the Syrian government. And so that, that's what has, has occurred this week. Um, in terms of, of trying to understand, as it were, the context of this, the context of this is that uh, since 2013, the uh, Guta uh, chemical attack, which is still controversial, but following that, uh, Syria uh, signed up to the Chemical Weapons Convention and went through a policy of handing over all, all, or destroying all of its chemical and biological weapons. But since then, uh, allegations have been consistently made by Western governments and also their allies on the ground in Syria that the Syrian government is systematically carrying out chemical attacks and some sarin uh, nerve agent attacks in the country. And this has been a regular feature of uh, the allegations being made since 2014, which, as you rightly point out, the Syrian government, the Russian government, uh, denies that they are responsible for it. The Western governments uh, are saying that they are carrying out these attacks. And in the middle of this, the OPCW, the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, has been tasked with investigating uh, these events and then reporting on them. So that's the, the broad context. There's a, there's a, a series of you know, systematic claims and allegations made over time that have been investigated. Now, where this has all become very, very controversial, and although you're correct to point out the IIT report, which has just come out in Sarah Kibb, really, the, the really big controversy over the last two years has been over the alleged counter attack in Duma and, and what has flown out, uh, flowed from that. Um, and really the, the underlying issue here is that, or the, the, the argument made for people who are questioning the OPCW investigations and also questioning what the uh, Western governments are claiming, is that the OPCW in nearly all of these incidents has not been able to actually visit the sites themselves. They have been primarily reliant upon groups on the ground passing information which goes out of Syria and then goes to the OPCW. And the criticism is that the information that they're taking in order to build their reports and in order to essentially to establish their allegations of chemical weapons use, this is all information which is being supplied by groups who are not independent in the conflict, who are effectively um, sort of associated with belligerent groups in the conflict, the most famously, of course, being the White Helmets, um, also described themselves as the Syrian civil defense. Um, but the White Helmets have been a key part of, of this information being passed. And so the criticism has been is that this isn't necessarily reliable information, um, that if you're relying upon uh, uh, facts and material being produced by one side in a conflict in order to produce your reports, you might well be uh, sort of dealing with disinformation. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that has been at the heart of, of this concern and, and over time criticism. Criticism has always been there since the Guter attack in 2013 as to who was responsible for this. And of course, back in 2013, um, the Obama administration had drawn a red line and was going to carry out an attack. But Obama pulled back from that because there was doubt within the US intelligence services as to who had carried out the Saran attack. And uh, Seymour Hersh, the American journalist at the time, wrote about how rebel groups or opposition groups that obtained sarin via Turkey and so on. So that controversy has been there since then. But then with these FFM missions and, and the chemical weapons attack, this is sort of built and built over time um, and culminated in some way with the Duma incident, and I'll, I'll stop in a second, the Duma incident in 2018, when this was an area of Damascus which was about to be retaken by Syrian government forces, and then there was an alleged attack where 50 plus civilians were killed. 
And what was different about this incident, apart from immediately there were claims that it had been staged, the Russian Federation claimed it was a staged attack and so on. Almost immediately, what, what happens is the Syrian government was able to regain that territory and then for the first time an OPCW team was actually allowed in on the ground in Duma to actually investigate what had happened. So rather than relying heavily upon white helmets and belligerent associated groups for information, they were able to get a team in on the ground. And what then happened was that the team produced an initial report on what had happened and the report, which is now publicly available because it's been leaked, raised a lot of very serious questions about whether an attack had occurred at all. When that report was prepared by the Duma team, um, then at the last minute before it was published, somebody in the OPCW came in secretly altered the report and then attempted to publish a doctored version. And this created immediately an argument within the OPCW because one of the inspectors who was involved in the report production discovered that it had been changed and manipulated and then there was an internal protest. And since then, really in a way, the rest is history. There's been this growing building controversy over manipulation of the OPCW investigation in the case of Duma. Um, which has led to leaks, it's led to testimony, and it's led to statements from former OPCW scientists and so on. Really making the argument that the OPCW investigations have been co-opted effectively by Western powers in order to shore up the allegation that it's the Syrian government carrying, carrying out the attacks. And, and that, I think, covers the, the key points of of where we are today, and of course, this report this week um, on Sarakib, it's the same issues that relate to Duma are applicable to that report. You have questions over what is going on in the OPCW, is it suffering from undue influence from America, Britain, and France, who I know publicly they claim that they're bystanders in the conflict, but I think everyone knows full well, and it's well established that France, Britain, and America have been seeking to overthrow the Syrian government since very early on, since 2011. Um, and, and that's where the controversy is. Um, and that's where the controversy is today and, and, it, and persisting, really. But as you said, with all sides sticking to their guns um, and so on. And the OPCW under increasing scrutiny, I guess, is the best way to put it for what's been going on. Yeah, I think I think I find this to be um, you know very very disturbing because the OPCW, which I think was set up uh, as a result of the, um, the the Chemical Weapons Convention, should be in theory a, a neutral organisation which goes in there and, uh, and and has a particular job, has a has a has a role, but is not taking sides on on whether um, uh, whether blame should be apportioned to to one particular side or not. So, what, do you know what what's happening internally within the OPCW, which is allowing this kind of manipulation to to, to happen? Well, in, in a way, this is in a way nothing new. Um, if, if, if people look into the OPCW controversy, they, they will see that there have been a number of open letters signed by a variety of international experts. But Jose Bustani, who is the first director general of the OPCW, has been one of the figures who has been speaking out, saying something has gone wrong in the OPCW. We must listen to these inspectors who are trying to blow the whistle within the organization. Because Jose Bustani was ousted by the Americans from the OPCW in the run up to the Iraq War. And of course, as most people know, the history of the Iraq War, the, the deception over weapons of mass destruction. Bustani, heading the OPCW, was seen by the Americans as somebody who wasn't playing ball, and they forced him out of the organization. And, and really, I think since then, sort of the, the, the working sort of idea is that the OPCW has been not properly independent of the US, not properly independent of the US and its allies, specifically in relation to the Syria FFMs. And you can see this in, inter in, in statements which have emerged from 
former officials and senior officials in the organization. One of the problems within the OPCW with Syria is that the investigation of alleged events in Syria have been conducted by a fact-finding mission, which is not directly accountable to, I think, the verification and inspectorate divisions, but is directly accountable to the Office of the Director General, the ODG. And so what that means is normally when the OPCW investigates something, it should be the scientists who are in control of the verification and um, ver sorry, the verification and inspectorate divisions. But with the Syria FFM, it's being controlled from the Office of the Director General. And when Duma happened, uh, the Chief of Cabinet was a British career diplomat, uh, Robert Fairweather. When since then, Sebastian Braha, who's a French career diplomat, has been the chief of cabinet. And so what you effectively have is you have a potential for political influence on the FFM operations. So they're not really being conducted in the way that you would normally carry out investigations. Mm -hmm. And obviously, if you think of those personnel, obviously, French diplomat, British career diplomat, um, it opens the door for that kind of political influence um, into what's been going on. And I think structurally at the core, that's a problem. I could say more, and in the working group I'm a member of, we have published material on this, but there are individuals who are clearly within the OPCW, but clearly closely associated to the UK government. So for example, OPCW inspectors who also or awarded an OBE from the British government and so on. And if you get into the details of what's been going on, there's, there's clearly been an issue, a serious issue with uh, the personnel and their relationship mm -hmm. to uh, France, America, and particularly the UK in this case, because the UK has been a particularly important uh, player in the Syrian conflict in terms of strategic communications and, and so on. Um, but I think that's the, that's the core problem you have. You have, you know, and it's important to emphasize is that most of the OPCW does a very good job and most of its staff are dedicated and do an excellent job. The problem here is with the Syria FFMs and the way they have been set up and the way that has made them vulnerable to influence, which I think is at the heart of why you see this problem that we see with, with the chemical weapons claims. Um, that, that's not really objective, it's not really independent. Um, and of course, things have reached a, a kind of a boiling point with Duma because the, you know, the inspectors got in on the ground, they came back, they had an awful lot of questions about what had really happened, and then they get closed down, then they get sidelined, reports get changed. And that creates um, what you have now, which is you have, there are two main inspectors who are known to have been essentially blowing the whistle on what happened but also there are other people within the organization who have also spoken to people such as myself and to other people about what has been going on so um clearly uh, co-optation is the best way of describing it co-optation with Syria ffms by france uk and the us primarily um, and of course, they are belligerent in the conflict. Um, sure. Um, what what I find um, also very disturbing about about this this whole thing, as someone coming from from the ind independent media, um, is that it took me possibly ten or fifteen minutes of, of research um, to to find all kinds of. Uh, articles online um, sites which are raising alarm bells about this but somehow the mainstream media um, doesn't have any particular interest in questioning the narrative which is being fed by the OPCW in this case but you know clearly from um, from the uh, from the states which are France the UK which are which are trying to manipulate these these reports um, What's going on in the? Why is the mainstream media not interested in doing its job and highlight and putting a spotlight on uh, on issues like this? Well, I, I think that there's a, a general answer and a more specific answer to that question. The general answer is that you know, if you look at the political or if you look at the critical political communication literature generated over the last 40, 50 years, you know, it, it continually 
points out that the mainstream media are very closely located to political and economic power. And I, I guess Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman's manufacturing consent is, is the most well-known articulation of that argument. But lots of other political communication scholars have made this argument. And we know that, especially when it comes to foreign policy, mainstream media are, are, are very risk averse. Mm -hmm. They're very reluctant to challenge power. There's a whole variety of reasons for that, from patriotism through to dependence upon official sources. And that goes some of the way to explaining the fact that the mainstream media, and when it comes to war and conflict, it tends to toe the line. And even if the kind of controversial wars, if you look at the Vietnam War, for example, it took a long time before American media started to really question the Vietnam War. And it wasn't until the Tet Offensive and, and after that, really, when you had actually a political argument over that war that you saw American mainstream media really starting to get more critical of that war. Same goes for Iraq in 2003. A lot of the mainstream media was supportive of the invasion and the controversy didn't really emerge until after that invasion had occurred. So we know the media doesn't tend to play a very particularly independent role, that's putting it mildly, when it comes to foreign policy. This case, and if you listen to people such as Peter Hitchens, who's one of the few mainstream journalists who has reported on this issue, um, he, he says it's remarkable that even here where you have whistleblowers and you have documents, a very large volume of documents available, it's remarkable that the mainstream media still seems so reluctant to engage with it. And the only explanation I, I, I have for that is that I think that you know, in, in recent years, the mainstream media has become, in a sense, even more intensely or closely linked to political power than it was, say, in Herman Chomsky's time or 20 years ago. We know that the mainstream media is it's, it's a very vulnerable industry. Journalists are uh, on short-term contracts. There's this problem with ch journalism, just repeating press briefings. But there's a real, I, I think, the strength and... The, the strength and degree of autonomy that you could detect, say, back in Vietnam or over Iraq 2033 has, has dissipated almost entirely from the mainstream media now. And so they're very reluctant to, to touch it. I, I think the other side of that argument is that the war on Syria is, is you know, whatever your position on the war, it's certainly the case that um, Western media has, has very much brought into one specific narrative on the war. And this has been going on for a very long time now. And I, and I think there's an awful lot to lose for mainstream media who have clearly sort of shored up and supported Western government claims. They have an awful lot to lose credibility-wise to admit that maybe we've got this wrong. It's not as with Iraq where you had, well, the invasions happened and all the information comes out and, and the media said, well, we made a mistake because that was just a phase of about a year, wasn't it, the run up to the Iraq invasion and then immediately afterwards. This has been going on for so long. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that that's that's a fact. The, the final thing I would add, and, and I, I'm a good example of this, a walking case study of it, anybody who does ask questions about the war in Syria is subjected to the most ferocious attacks on social media. I mean, when I formed a working group with some academics, we were immediately being smeared as sadists, Putinists, conspiracy theorists, war crimes deniers. And, and this has really been quite ferocious. I mean, I, I've lost count of the numbers of newspaper articles written by, um, well, by the Huffington Post and the Times particularly, which attack us for asking questions and for investigating this. Even when you now have, I think, with, with the latest open letter about the OPCW, you have Admiral Lord West, who's on the Intelligence and Security Committee, signing that um, and, and saying in public there's a problem. You still have, he doesn't get attacked as, a, as, a, as an assadist, but all the small, low-hanging fruit like me, you get severely attacked. And it's intimidating, and it puts a lot of people off. I, I know an American a high profile you know, celebrity who, who, who said to me that one thing was said by this person on social media regarding Syria and they had never seen the volume of attacks and smears and trolls on any other issue in, in their life. So there is a very well oiled machine out there and if you raise questions, even if you just raise questions, you get attacked very ferociously. And so when Duma happened on the 7th of April, 2018, 
um, I'm the working group I'm a part of, hadn't actually even published anything on Syria. Um, I said some comments about questions to be raised. And the day that the US and the French and the Americans were bombing Syria, the 14th of April, it's three years ago now, front page of the Times newspaper, Assadists working in British universities, conspiracy theorists trying to deny that Assad is carrying out chemical weapon attacks. That was on the front page of the Times. There was also an editorial essentially calling for our jobs, and then there was um, our pictures in there and so on. And that that's an extraordinarily concerted attack on an almost unknown group of academics who were simply saying, well, there are some questions to be asked about the Syrian war, as academics should be doing. Mm -hmm. And that the scale of that cannot be underestimated. I, I have files of the attacks and the smears, and some of them very unpleasant you know, threats almost over social media. And that puts people off touching the issue. Sure. Because people just think, is this really worth my while? Do I really want to get involved in talking about this conflict? Um, and, you know, I, I, and I, it, it does it does have an effect it doesn't shut up everybody but a lot of people i think look at look at the war and just think there are bigger i've got bigger fish to fry or yeah. it's not worth it it's it's, yeah. it's it's a feeling i get from some of my academic colleagues who know me well and who i've worked with for years who who don't touch the subject i i just get get the sense that they just think don't want to go there um so i yeah cancel culture alive and well um yes I, I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to, to change the subject a little bit because you know uh, in presenter we're an independent media we're, we're, we want to we want to publish reliable information information that people can can trust um, and which comes from a point of view of trying to you know tr trying to show the benefits of peace and nonviolent conflict resolution this kind of stuff that we do but what can people, at least those who are a little bit suspicious of the information that comes to them through the media, what, what can they do to better protect themselves from the propaganda that surrounds them? Well, I, I think in, in the first instance, pe people really need to really learn that the mainstream media is, is, is very closely located to political and ec economic power. R read the classic text, read Herman Chomsky, read even the mainstream versions of that from people like Lance Bennett, the, the American academic. Understand that when you watch the mainstream media, you're getting an angle on this issue in the same way that somebody in China who's watching Chinese state news is getting an angle, etc. It might not be as, as, as propagandized, but it's still an angle. So recognize that, first of all, and then second, especially given what I said before about the state of mainstream media today, is that people need to go to independent media, such as you, other alternative independent media, and start to read around and start to try to recognize that, you know, that there is useful, important information in a whole variety of media outlets. See, even, you know, Russia Today and, and Chinese media and Iranian media look at that look at the BBC, but also very much look at the independents, because I think the independents is, is probably the most important site of information at the moment. And of course, people have got to stop thinking they're going to get all the answers if they look at one or two of these, but you can at least start to see the, the variety of opinions and arguments being made. And in the process of doing all of that, to proper protect, better protect yourself, is is people really, I think most people have the intelligence to start to sift through information, to draw their own judgments after a period of time. And people really need to sort of have confidence in their own intelligence and confidence in their own ability to judge information. And, and I think one of the things that I saw when I was teaching in university was this decline in independent thinking. And, you know, students wanting to be told, well, what's going on, et cetera. But I, I think, you know, people, democracy requires people to work hard, right? People have to think and think for themselves. But people can do that. And I think if people, you know, separate themselves from you know, adherence to the mainstream media, look at this rich variety of independent media out there, think and think for themselves. You know, go and look at the primary documents which are circulating around about the OPCW. Don't take the word of a journalist or me. Let's just look at the documents which are available and then use their own intelligence. It's hard work, but that's what democracy, I think democracy involves hard work from citizens. If we're apathetic, we lose democracy, right? 
Piers, thank you so much uh, for, for this really fascinating uh, half an hour. Um, we're very grateful for, for, for you to be available to, to have this conversation with us. And um, I'm fairly sure that uh, in the future, we'll be back in contact with you to ask about uh, other, other elements that, that you and the working group uh, and the Organization for Propaganda Studies are, uh, are investigating. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Great, that was good, that was really good.